I also want to take a quick second here and let you know that we are being audio recorded and therefore when at the end when we take questions, uh, Cusin has asked that people come up to the mic to ask a question so that it can get recorded. And, uh, and also with that I want to thank Linda, Linda over there on support. She is going to help us get through this process together. Um, I am Chris Kofel. Um, I am the clinical partner and welcome if you're here to see Academic clinical partnerships, you're in the right spot, as we tell students, right? Um, a little bit about my background. I've been a registered nurse for 38 years. Uh, most of that time has been in practice in critical care. I have been an educator in acute care for the last 15 years. And my last three years has been with a uh, relationship in academics with Lourdes University. And I'm Judy Didion. I'm the Dean of the College of Nursing at Lourdes University. And we're housed just right outside of Toledo, Ohio. Um, so that's our proximity together. Uh, I have been Dean for about uh, almost eight years now and, and in education for over 25 years. Um, also, my focus has been public health, so I feel like Cusin is part of it all fits together. So um, we hope to share today our story of how we um, developed this partnership as a means to institute our cusin based curriculum in our BSM program. So we're going to tell our story today. But before we start, we wanted, wondered if any um, of you in the audience are involved in an academic clinical partnership right now. So about half. And how many have are in the process of instituting uh, CUSIN in a curriculum? And how many have already accomplished it? Okay, so we plan to learn from you, too, <laughs> as you move through this process. So our hope is that we can share at the end of the uh, program. We're going to leave a good 15, 20 minutes to have some discussion. Just so you know, we have um, no conflicts uh, with this presentation. And Chris is going to talk about the objectives. Our first objective today is to identify national trends for academic clinical partnerships and how that framework works with us. We're going to talk a little bit about development of an academic clinical partnership. And then we're going to identify the specific steps we took in our case to, uh, for our partnership. There are two handouts in case you haven't gotten them. The first one is the PowerPoint presentation, and the second one is an article that we were able to published in 2012 in the Journal of Professional Nurse Nursing on this topic. So um, hopefully you'll have that. But as Judy said, we're really here just to tell our story. Um, we're going to talk about our story of our partnership, about how CUSIN in, was involved in that partnership, and how concept-based curriculum has changed all of those components. I think a little uh, uh, background as to where we're coming from is helpful. We're, we're a, uh, Lord's University is a small private university, and you can see we only have about 2,200 students. About um, a third of our students are in nursing education, either at the undergraduate or graduate level. But what's unique about this is that uh, we are not housed in an academic um, health science center. So partnerships for us might be different than someone that has a uh, an institutional partnership. So uh, we have worked hard, it's, I'm sure those of you out there in education, uh, developing partnership for clinical education. And um, sometimes with that, there's a difference in how you might um, strategize and move ahead on that. So we'll share that today. The partner is ProMedica. ProMedica is uh, started as uh, 12 separate little hospitals, all working independently in northwest Ohio and southeast Michigan. Um, we are now a healthcare system. We have physicians' offices, home care, hospice, and Paramount. Paramount is our insurance company. 
We are a locally owned nonprofit health care system, 4.4 million patient encounters, 81,000 discharges, and 57,000 surgeries annually. In 2011, what started to unite the system, as the system came together to uh, better balance purchasing policy, transitions, all of those components, we developed a center of nursing excellence. And when that center of nursing excellence came on board, we took nursing educators from multiple areas of the hospitals, and we created an onboarding team, a team for transition to practice, the residency program, uh, we have system now educators so that if we have a policy at one hospital is the policy across the board, and that person writes the, the education for all of the different hospitals. We have system practice managers, and we pro provide CNE providership. To be able to better understand today's climate, we need to look at the history and how we got to where we are. Academic and clinical partnerships have been around for a very long time, and we know that nursing cannot take place in isolation without their clinical partners, nor should the clinical partners think that they can live in isolation without the schools of nursing. However, the quality of this relationship impacts the quality of education, the nursing workforce, and eventually and ultimately the patients we care for. What type of affiliations are there? Well, there are teaching hospitals, there's non-academics, and then there are the non-traditional settings for this relationship. Judy's going to tell us the Cuson story. There were, well, as all of you have um, probably felt this, there's a lot going on in academics as well as our, our health care delivery systems as far as change. So there was a lot of momentum that led up, led up to this um, partnership. And, of course, Cuson was part of this. Um, when the Cuson initiative uh, began in 2005, uh, and Robert Wood Johnson funded this uh, to um, evolve and how, how we can implement quality and safety in nursing education. We started to see the strands coming down um, into our nursing education programs, looking at how the school curricula um, was more available for us as far as the resources, the lessons, the books. And as we started to look at our own undergraduate uh, curriculum, it had been around since 1987. Um, so, it, of course, you know, we patched and tweaked and improved over time. But when we began to really look at uh, what we wanted to do as far as moving forward and then were introduced by um, Linda Cronowet to, to CUSIN and those competencies, it really accelerated our um, faculty's decision to look at this as a framework for change. So. That was the beginning of our redesign, and we've seen this happening across the nation. So many of us are here today to share these, um, these ideas, but I, um, what, what we, we certainly saw was the need for the partnership. At the same time, we also saw our national organizations, the American Association of College of Nursing, the American um, uh, the Association of, of Nurse Executives, coming together and um, actually framing a call for action. And there is um, on the website, you can read more details about this, but how, does, uh, how do we teach, how do we create a workforce for the future in isolation where, uh, are the questions out there. So there's a call for action for academic clinical partnerships, looking at how these reciprocal, reciprocal relationships um, can develop. And I think this is... Part of what we want to emphasize today that this is not a, a take, you know, we, we're going to use you for a clinical education spot. They're going to use us for um, in a, a future employee. It's really l working together to see in your community what kind of, of um, health care providers you want to have and how we can work together to develop those that will be prepared for that future. A lot of coordination. <laughs> And then, of course, the IOM charge. We saw what was coming down as far as um, the fragmented health care system, the numbers of errors nationally, um, hospital-acquired issues, and how, as nurse faculty, can we prepare our students for this world where they might not always be in a, a clinical setting that is a positive experience. 
And also, um, how can we create partnerships together so that we can create systems for nurses to achieve not only their educational goals, but the career goals, and um, how do we prepare our workforce for the future. So there was multiple national initiatives going on at the same time um, we were looking at our curriculum change. So before we, we start um, talking about our specific partnership, we wanted to also talk about more, a little bit more about the trends and some of the guidelines that are available out there um, for resources in developing a relationship. And if you read the guidelines, you'll see that there's some, um, there, there's, there's certain uh, principles that can help you not only in planning for a relationship, but also evaluating your relationship over time for its sustainability. So if formal relationships are established, and usually it, what might, I mean, this is what we have found, at the senior le level, it can trickle down to multiple levels of the organization. So it's very important for those senior people to have those shared goals, those mutual goals, to help support what is happening at the bedside nurse level as well as at the um, educator and student level. So this takes time and deliberate action. Um, this means that as my position as a dean, I had to become very familiar with who the leaders were in the nursing um, practice arena in our area. And because when we look at QSIN and implementing a QSIN-based curriculum, one of the questions we had was how do we teach our students about quality and safety and look at quality and safety indicators if they're not shared? Now, we know a lot of, of information is more available um, today than it was five years ago. But five years ago, we were looking at um, how do we help our students understand quality, which means that, that um, the practice partner would need to be transparent about some issues that weren't transparent before. We're at a really funny time right now where everyone is moving towards um, creating a just culture, but it's not there yet. So there's a lot of, um, of communication that's, that's required to, to move these partnerships forward. So Chris, tell us about the importance of shared knowledge and commitment in these partnerships. Shared knowledge is a cornerstone of all of this. Can I see another show of hands of who are partners out here? And how did your staff find out about CUSIN? And masters in programs. So, so as a student, you brought it back to your hospital. Anybody else? Anybody else st just struggling to figure out how to get CUSIN into practice? Presentation. Yeah. It just so happened that the National Conference was in Milwaukee and there was one of the oh. bottom A wonderful coincidence, huh? But in reality, practice has a really hard time getting this piece of information because academics have been working with Houston for seven years now and they've talked about it, they've spent lots of money developing that, but practice really hasn't. So the sharing of knowledge is very important. And part of that, what we learned as a practice partner is, is that we were actually given front row seats to Houston. We got to see Houston up close and personal, and we began the process of analysis of what will Houston do for us in practice. If we had not had this partnership, we would not have been at that table. Another process that we need to share is evidence-based practice and practice-based evidence. It goes both sides. There needs to be an understanding of the regulatory bodies for both acute care and for schools of nursing. And what are those regulators asking of our staffs? Um, one of the things that our partnership ended up doing is, is we now have a blended IRB. The School of Nursing at Lourdes University and ProMedica's IRB accepts each other's IRB process. Therefore, our employees who are now students in their master's program at Lourdes do, do not have that difficulty of doing two IRBs. Woohoo! Um, academic and clinical need to have current knowledge 
of our different competencies. Uh, one of the things recently that we just talked about in our grant meetings was the whole idea of, uh, yes, they need to know how to do, we're talking about pre-licensure BSN students. Yes, they need to know how to do um, injections. But you know what? More than 50% of the medications we're given in the hospital are IV push. Let's kind of focus on this, guys. This is our competency. We need to move that more into the simulation lab. Um, and finally, if possible, to sit on each other's boards. We need to have a voice. As nurses, we need to sit on the boards of both our schools of education and in an acute care setting. The last thing that we notice, and it is a theme that comes over and over again, academics and practice do not always speak the same language. We may even be using the same word, but the interpretation of that word is different. And the example I can give you is the word competency. Competency to Judy and the faculty there means we're going to teach and then you're going to respond. In, in practice, competency means show me what you know. So the commitment to be a shared among partners also, there needs to be a commitment of trust and respect there needs to be shared decision-making between the partners. There needs to be shared opportunities, like conferences, but also educational opportunities within the site. One of the things that we developed was that our first semester, or not first semester, third semester, but first into the med surge areas, they follow the respiratory therapists around. That was a partnership decision that they really need to have more experience with heart and lung sounds, but specifically, what can the respiratory therapists teach them about treatments? And so we just built that right into their design. And there needs to be joint meetings between the national um, organizations from both sides. A common a commitment to shared by partners to maximize the potential of each student, faculty, and RNs to reach the highest level of his or her individual scope of practice. One of the things that um, enabled me to uh, learn more about Houston was the National State Board of Nursing Transition to Practice uh, National Study. How many people have heard of that study? All right. NCSBN's study started in July of 2011, and it incorporated Illinois, Ohio, and um, North Carolina. That study looked at transition to practice, and they created a, a web-based education, and those of us who were lucky enough to be into the intervention stage then got to see what QSIN was about because QSIN was at the base of the model that they designed. I just have to comment on what Chris said. I remember the first day... Um, well, the first, we have an advisory council meeting or where we invite our practice partners to our, our school and talk about our curriculum. And the first time we used the term QSIN, we could have been in a foreign country yeah. <laughs> because it did. It, it seemed to be a very difficult concept um, to understand, and, and mm -hmm. how to broaden that is, uh, it was one of our challenges as we developed our, our partnership um, ongoing. So, but... To have a successful partnership and uh, really does require constant evaluation analysis of what is going on between the practice and the academic setting. And most of the time this is occurring in the clinical education and how it's structured. Um, we also know that there, ha there are other types of partnerships that are very important for the academic practice setting, and that is our, uh, articulation uh, um, agreements that are or um, seamless transition curricula for RN to BSN, RN to MSN, on and on. And this is important because as educators, we're serving the needs of that uh, clinical setting because their workforce uh, it does look to see where they can advance in their career, and that, that organization needs to, wants to support you, but you have to do that again, um, together, not in isolation.
what practice does to support the ongoing educational achievements is, is that many of your institutions probably have tuition reimbursement for returning RN to BSN or BSN to MSN students. And, and part of that is an encouragement to allow the bedside staff to understand we value education. We want you back in school and we're going to support you as much as possible. The other method that uh, practice does to support educational achievement is with continuing nursing education and trying to, and at least in our facility, we try to meet the, we're in the state of Ohio, so we try to meet all of the state of Ohio requirements for all of our uh, nurses uh, across all levels of, of practice, whether it's acute care, home care, or uh, hospice. So again, um, the national movement does support and actually encourage academic clinical partnerships. And these eight principles um, that are listed on the next two slides were really addressed in the last few minutes, um, have been helpful for us, not only in guiding us, but also in evaluating and looking at how, how are we sustaining, how can we continue, and how can we um, further develop our partnership. So as we integrated QSIN in clinical education, this partnership became more and more valuable. And we'll talk about how that happened. I thought it was kind of important to take a step back and look at the timeline of how things occurred. Um, you know, hospitals and healthcare have been involved in safety and education and quality improvement for a long time. Um, it actually started in 1906 with the signing of the Food and Drug Act. It also, in 1951, Joint Commission was established. And in 1965, we were, uh, there was the accreditation by Joint Commission for Hospitals. 1989, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality was initiated. And in 1996, Sentinel events started. So you can see that our uh, influence comes from many different places. As a matter of fact, to me, it, I believe that there are three things that have influenced uh, the whole quality and safety. First, there was governmental influence initially. Second, there has been the Internet. In 1995, the Internet became commercialized, and look how it has changed our lives. With public reporting, patients identifying hospitals, all of that component. And then the third is consumers. Consumers are now driving our, many of our dashboards and, and our recommendations. In 2003, National Patient Safety Goals came out. In 2005, the first group in CUSIN started working on this whole component. And, they, and in phase three in 2009... Personally, for our practice, we started in 2011 with the transition to practice, and in August of 2012, we had our first clinical educational resource unit based on QSIN due to our partnership. Judy, can you tell us what happened in the curriculum? This is a timeline, and um, of what was going on in relation to activities that we were already embarking on with the ProMedica Health System. Um, we actually use multiple clinical agencies besides ProMedica, uh, but we have had a long-standing history of working collaboratively with them on different state grants, on different continuing education programs. And I, I just want to emphasize this because it's so important to have those informal relationships with your clinical partners. Um, as an educator, sometimes I feel like half of our job is public relations <laughs> as well as, as teaching our students, but it's so important. We need to, um, we can't just show up in a, an organization without any relationship. It's not good for the student, it's not good for the patient, it's not good for that nurse at the bedside who's working with that student and faculty member. And as many of us hire more and more part-time adjunct, it's even more important to try to figure out how we can create an environment of learning that is, you know, not, you can never take away all the stress, but as 
as least stressful as possible. And part of that is by um, having clinical agencies that really um, want to be with us. So, um, so this is a little bit of the history of some of the, the other projects that we were involved in before we instituted CUSIN, and, I, and that became our foundation because then we could call them, and that was from the top down. I was part of the nursing, Center for Nursing Excellence um, Committee um, at ProMedica, so that certainly helped from a leadership perspective. But our faculty were also involved in um, writing grants with some of the ProMedica um, uh, managers or staff, or, be, or they were involved in their practice councils or their research councils. So these were kind of, to me, the roots um, that had to be laid before we could start to um, really institute CUSIN in these organizations. Because if you start a curriculum that expects a student to look at quality and safety and question the environment that they're practicing in, you have to have a relationship with that organization so they're not threatening. I mean, it really, who wants to hear a student question them about how they're practicing? So there's a lot of preparation that has to be done, and that's, that's why the relationship was, was so important. In sticking with our objectives, uh, next we're going to talk about the history, changes, and goals of our academic clinical partnership. And the history is that um, ProMedica has served as a clinical site for our, the BSN, MSN, and the nurse anesthesia program. And Lourdes has provided continuing education. Lourdes faculty are, does sit on our nursing research council and our board of advisors. And our CNOs and educators sit on Lourdes advisory board. So there is that constant uh, coming back and forth of sharing ideas there. Then there was the NEPCURE uh, HRSA grant, and that created the formal partnership was started. Next we're going to talk about uh, changes that occurred that made it just right for the partnership. Judy? So um, the major change um, that occurred in this list is that we did t take on um, a huge curriculum change. And that began when we started to hear about Houston, and then we started to um, become more familiar. We, brought, we were able to bring in a, a national consultant as we started to think about our curriculum. So not only did we want to integrate Houston, but we thought we need to, we have a very content-laden curriculum, so we moved towards a concept base. And then finally, we, we really did the crazy thing, and we flipped our curriculum around. Um, knowing that CUSIN looks at quality indicators, looks at population, looks at outcomes, looks at prevention, risk reduction, we thought, why are we waiting till the last semester to teach our public health course? So what we actually did is we flipped it around to initiate our um, population focus, prevention, health promotion, all first semester of our five-semester curriculum. So as we did this, you know, we were working with ProMedica on this opportunity to write a grant. And we were able to um, successfully receive a HRSA grant, a nursing education quality retention um, grant. And that allowed us some, a lot of seed money, which was wonderful, to really embark on this curriculum change. But it, it also um, helped us to substantiate some of this clinical partnering so that we could make some firm establishments in how we planned our clinical education. The changes that occurred in le I'm sorry. That's OK. <laughs> uh, the changes that occurred from the practice side was, first of all, our leadership. Our leadership changed, and they became more open to it. Our vice president was engaged and interested in creating this partnership. The other change that occurred, that initially when the grant went through, this was going to be a part-time of other duties as assigned staff development role, this clinical integration partner. Now, everybody knows if it's not your main job, is it your priority? No. And so we were very concerned about all of that. And as I said, I am the clinical integration partner, which meant that uh, prior to that, I was the transition to practice 
coordinator, and I had a very small role in practice at that time. They came to me and they said, would you be interested in taking this on? And I thought, well, I don't know very much about academics, but it sounds like a great opportunity. So it went from two people kind of looking at the job to one person looking at it very, very seriously. Um, and what was nice about that whole component was is that I had worked at both of the hospitals we initially started in. So I was uh, a face that everyone seemed to recognize. So both sides here have made some changes, and therefore... All of the cosmic effects came together, and the changes were there, and we were able to have this poof, the partnership was going to appear to work. Judy? So our, our goal for this partnership was really to develop and implement the curriculum, but we also knew one of our goals would be to develop the human capital that we needed to successfully um, carry out this curriculum. So that is, um, we spent a lot of time with faculty development, adjunct faculty development, and then development of RNs at the bedside. On the clinical side, our goals were simple. We wanted to, we had looked at the DEUs, dedicated educational units, but in our state that was not really a, a form that we were allowed to use by OBN. So we had to look at something a little bit different. So we created dedicated, we did not create dedicated, but we called them educational resource units. Um, we also said that we wanted to look at this movement of students. And what we decided was is that the semester three, which was our first med surge experience, and their semester four were going to be on the same unit, um, same patient population, back to back. So therefore, if they're there in um, August to December, they come right back in January to May, and they are working with the same nurses. This allows the students to become part of our culture. It keeps them ingrained. And what really is very nice, the staff nurses go, oh, our Lord's students are back. And they, and they look forward to them. The students did some wonderful things. They created posters with their pictures on it, you know, and they, they really went out of their way. But our point was is, is that we wanted them to be uh, engaged with the frontline nurses and learning those students. And the other goal that practice had is, is that practice needed to learn CUSIN. And what a, what a great way to learn CUSIN if not from the students. You make it sound so easy, Chris. <laughs> there were bumps. We'll talk about that. But um, really one of the, the other aspects that what we observed as this whole phenomenon evolved was that there was a change in clinical education. We started to see the faculty-student teams changing to become like the faculty, student, staff, and patient teams, which was a wonderful wonderful thing to see. Um, for years, you know, the faculty would say to me, I, I am, I'm so tired. I have, and we're very fortunate. We have six students in a clinical group. I know that's, we haven't told our president that that's not the standard. But <laughs> shh, this is being recorded. Oh, shh. Oh, oh, well, we'll wipe that out. But no, um, we are very fortunate. They have supported that for a long time. And, and with that, Though our our faculty would come back and say, "I'm so tired. It's I, I all my students had two patients, and I feel like I had 12 patients for the day," and 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 we know that wasn't true, but that's kind of what the state of the clinical was from the academic side. So, trying to change that and and move that around so that everyone is accountable for that patient, and then it's a, a team of educators, not just faculty. So students were part of the, um, were actively involved, the staff, and then students also became part of the quality improvement planning for the units, and I think this is a result of having them there for two semesters. They became more f familiar with the different staff, and they became part of, um, you know, a sense of belonging there. What we asked of the staff nurses is to change their accountability. They needed to, to take on some of the responsibility of student education and not in the sense of a preceptor, but simply as a registered nurse role model there at the bedside. We asked them to be, create, be part of the production of the new nurses and to invest in the workforce that would rescue and then eventually replace us. So our third objective 
was to identify the themes that we noted that make um, a practice uh, clinical, I'm sorry, academic clinical partnership successful. And the three themes we came up with, communication, financial relationship, and standardization. So Judy, let's talk about communication. Well, as we looked at the different levels of communication, communication with this partnership, it really became apparent that there had to be some planned, consistent um, communication. And I think because academics was really concerned about quality and safety, and this movement towards quality and safety is very apparent in the practice setting. It was the first time they really were listening and, and, and interested in, in our curriculum, what we had to say, um, and they became better informed at the CNO and dean level, as well as the um, clinical managers and the faculty level. So integration of the CUSIN's concepts I saw as almost um, narrowing the gap between academics and clinical practice. What this partnership also allowed was is that there were quarterly reports now going back to the CNOs on these educational resource units and how well the students were being integrated. This conversation between myself and the CNOs Pay, made it more attention. You know, it's that kind of thing, you put it on your calendar, it happens. Well, we were now having those conversations on a regular basis. The, the CNOs were starting to wonder, what more could we do to make the students feel integrated into the units? The clinical managers in the School of Nursing faculty, at the end of the semester, there were meetings with each clinical manager. We did an evaluation process, and those managers reviewed and set goals for the next semester for their staff due to student involvement. That's the important part there, is, is that they were considered as part of the team. And the next thing that happened between the clinical managers and the School of Nursing faculty was is that this quality improvement project that was uh, clinical manager driven. And we're gonna talk about that at the end. Clinical adjuncts and instructors at the bedside there was more conversations. There were weekly roundings with each instructor. They were identifying uh, trends, gaps, and issues. Problems were solved. And it was in the immediacy of the moment. It wasn't something that at the end of the semester, that instructor came back and said, you know, all semester long, I couldn't get in to do QI on the uh, diabetic monitors. It was something that was announced initially up front and then taken care of type of a thing. An example of this was is that ProMedica, we thought we were helping the clinical instructors by creating a web-based orientation for them. We thought, yay, on their own time, they can go and do that. We also put a lot of documents there. But what we didn't realize until one of them told us is that when they're up on the units, they can't access the outside internet. And we didn't know that at the time when we dropped it there. Because we as employees could, but the clinical instructors, as whatever that level of security was, they couldn't get to the forms we thought they were using. So those kind of communication issues are, are very important. There were weekly check-ins with the patient care supervisors on issues with students that needed resolving, so nothing was left to burn and, and to fester. And this role of uh, the clinical in integration partner back at the academic site where the adjuncts don't usually have a lot of voice, I was the voice of the adjuncts, of the things that weren't working in the curriculum change. So there was that immediacy turnaround. And I, and I have to add, uh, add to this, in our community, um, I would say the majority of our acute care clinical um, are led by hired uh, part-time adjunct faculty, and I'm not sure if you have that same model. But many, I mean, there's, it, it's good because many of these adjunct faculty are currently practicing. They have a lot to offer as far as the current um, issues in electronic <laughs> health records and all those things that are changing every day. But the bad part is that they're off, they often feel isolated and fragmented. So with this partnership, we built in um, a, a safety valve, I guess, of our own, where, the, where not only was Chris there to hear what the adjuncts were struggling with, but we had 
faculty that were assigned to purposefully meet with those adjunct, either online, whatever worked for them, or face-to-face, -face, and talk to them about what are the students learning this week, what concepts are they covering, what exemplars are they using, so that they could literally feel part of our curriculum, not just out there teaching um, in isolation, but also they could help the students apply those concepts and uh, you know, like seek out patients that have similar issues that relate to the exemplar that they're covering. So it became a much more cohesive approach towards educating our students in the clinical area. Another example of communication is, is our practice has what we call patient safety huddles. First thing in the morning, 6.45 to just prior to report. The students were included into this which is nice that they had the safety huddles. But more importantly, all of the RNs and staff were there for the next 12-hour shift, and they included, the students would then speak up and say, our concept of the day is, we learned this in class, we are looking to start IVs this week. So everyone there, all 20 patient units, everyone knew the students had a focus and we all had to do this job. I know it seems silly that it's that small of a thing, but that made the staff nurses come out and go, hey, you know what? This guy over here really, you know, they're doing oxygenation, and this guy has crepitus that you're not going to believe, and we're going to drop a uh, chest tube. Come on. Well, before, if the student hadn't been assigned to that patient, that whole experience would have bypassed the group. So communication at many different levels are, is so very important. The financial relationship... Um, is another part of the puzzle. And as far as for practice side, it, ga it did pay a salary. It allowed for posters, books, and some conferences. It allowed for the academics to do... Well, and this is where we were able to um, provide uh, release time to faculty to be a semester coordinator. So as we rolled out our curriculum, we had five semesters, and each semester has we integrated the whole curriculum. So there was one clinical course and three didactic courses. And those didactic courses were to feed into that one clinical. So you can imagine the coordination behind that. So as we rolled this out, we had semester coordinators that would, 25% um, of their time was to assure that that was happening until we could create a routine around that. So that was part of the financial support from the grant. The other is we were able to purchase iPads for all of our clinical educators so that they could take them into the clinical setting and have instant resource for their faculty or for their students. Um, and I think it, you know, certainly it helped with looking up things. Um, but I think to, you know, as we look towards where healthcare is going, it was, it, it was a way to teach the students that you have to learn how to access that information. We're no longer in an age where we can expect them to memorize it all. Um, so that was, that was very helpful with this grant, too. Standardization is important. It, it is what maintains the um, work that you're doing in your partnership. And for us, in practice, what we ended up doing um, when I first started was as we looked at, well, what do we do with safety and quality? And we took the six competencies and by definition and their topics, and then we looked at all of our different councils and our different teams, and we got nursing leadership, um, put them under certain best team practices was part of teamwork and collaboration. These are... Safety Council, of course, went under safety. Nursing Informatics. We thought that was kind of easy. But we then moved on to, but wait a minute. We have a lot of tools that still meet this. And some of the tools were the SBAR, the uh, EICU, the uh, workstations on wheels, our transition to practice recognition, our NANDA, um, pre-checklist for procedures, uh, CINAHL, Sunrise Patient Flow, we then took all of those, made this wonderful crosswalk and said, you know what, this is great. This is what the system does for quality. But our partners were telling us, what do your staff do? What are they accountable for? 
for quality. So we had to go back and really look at what we were doing. And that started a lot of work on our end of it in practice. Did you have? Um, well, I, I, I think um, just to add to the standardization, as we rolled out the curriculum, we had to look at our, how are we managing um, issues related to didactic and clinical. How can we set up lessons plan, lesson plans so that a clinical educator will have a focused conference, uh, post-conference with their students or be able to um, reinforce what they were learning? And certainly integrating more simulation into our curriculum. Um, and most educators or academic programs are doing that now. We now see that it makes so much sense if we're implementing QSIN. You know, safety, we need to assure that our students can have an environment where they can make a mistake and not harm somebody. So we've actually set up simulation errors where we purposefully, you know, simulated an error so that the student will have to problem solve and learn how to do that in their lab versus moving into clinical and facing that for the first time. So understanding um, what just culture means, understanding that um, they have to use the tools that uh, Chris was talking about in the clinical setting as, as ways to uh, minimize any errors or mistakes. Um, we've also set up certain um, activities. They have the 60-second assessments they go in and they do with their uh, patients. They have environmental scans, which is very important. And again, I think it builds on that public health population-focused um, concept that they get the first and second semester. Uh, we want them to start to look at, you know, we do windshield surveys in the community. Well, they should be... They, should, they can do a similar windshield survey with their eyes in the clinical setting. So how can they apply those, ish, those, uh, those principles forward and assure that the system, the environment is safe as possible for that patient? Now again, this is where we had to do the staff development so that if the bedside nurse has a conversation with that student, they're on board with it. They're not caught off guard. Because I think that's where we as educators have to have to assure that our partners, our, the nurses that we work with, understand the expectations so they're not caught off guard with some of these questions um, that the students might have and they can be part of the education. So that leads us to challenges. Um, and at least for on the practice side, one of our biggest challenges is staff turnover. You know, you just get done educating 90 people, and then next semester, will those 90 people be around to help understand? And that's really very difficult. Um, in the resource units, so we have created some written materials, but to, very honestly, we're still working on the sustainability of the education we created. There was a mentoring component to all of this, and the mentoring of the relationship between clinical adjuncts and the staff to make them see each other as on the same team. Um, and that needs to continue without the grant and without my role. But most importantly, this was a pilot, and we want to move it to culture. As much as we have a wonderful partnership with Lord's University, we have seven other schools of nursing in our 12 facilities. We would like now that we know what we can, can learn from our partners. We'd like to move that into for all the schools that attend. Remember, in practice, there may be two or three different schools of nursing with the same group of nurses each week. I jokingly told the staff over at Lourdes, could you put them all in pink? just because none of the other schools wore pink. And I could say, the pink students are mine. And we didn't go that way. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, it is true. And I think we're in a, a little bit of a, a time frame right now where as everyone um, changes curriculum and then our new graduates move into the, the practice setting, 
it will be easier to sustain. But for right now, we have to really make an effort to continuously educate or provide resources to our clinical partners so they understand this quality and safety in nursing education and what that means as far as curriculum. Um, the other challenges we will have, and I'm sure all of you in academics have felt this, there's faculty and adjunct turnover. So as soon as we have, you know, we think we're, we're good, someone else is, re well, mostly retiring now, which is really <laughs> kind of scary. But um, that and curriculum drift. Anytime you make a change, it's always um, a constant, you know, feedback because we need to monitor and make sure that people are, you know, showing consistency in, in, the, in how they're carrying out their courses and how, how they're um, providing the clinical education. So both of those are, are huge challenges to sustain. The innovation was a clinical integration partner and part of that role that I had was I was an inside person, a resource for the nursing staff, usually when schools of nursing comes into acute care, there isn't a resource there for the staff nurse at the bedside to understand what's going on. Um, I was able to navigate practice and help the clinical instructors know current practice and policies, and I, I rounded weekly. But I was actually given a gift by the dean um, because my first quarter on this project, I was allowed to just shadow. I, I was data collecting. I was doing a needs assessment. I followed the clinical instructors around, and I watched how the, they interacted with the students. I watched how the students interacted with the bedside nurses, and I watched how the bedside nurses did or did not interact with the students. What I ended up seeing were two silos. And in one silo, there was the student and the instructor, and right in the middle was a wonderful patient. And they were doing a lot of work with that patient and back and around. And then over in the other silo was the bedside nurse. Now, what kind of questions went back and forth? Well, the students would go and ask for directions, tasks, where is equipment, to the RN at the bedside. And the RN would say, did you get that medication passed? But the real questions weren't being asked. The integration of learning wasn't occurring, and that was part of what we were doing with this new resource and something that we thought that was a little innovative. Having Chris, we call her the inside face, <laughs> um, there actually gave us a lot of insight into what was effective and what was ineffective clinical education. So. Um, We began to identify um, gaps in communication, and as we um, looked at our curriculum, we thought, you know, you really have to take this curriculum. It's not just to teach students about quality and safety in the clinical setting. It's also to teach faculty about quality and safety. We need to, to have the student-centeredness. We've always thought we could just lay CUSIN over faculty education models, and it would be very similar where you have a student-centered and you look at how can you best create an environment of learning for that um, student. So emphasizing the quality and safety, emphasizing system management. This is not someone else's job. If they see a problem, they need to problem solve about how that could be resolved. Certainly the student doesn't have access to all the resources, but going through that motion of well, if the equipment's not there, how would you get this equipment? Or if this is a problem, are you just going to walk away? I think one of the um, insightful um, comments Chris made one day was, I noticed that the students were really good about taking care of their two or four patients they were assigned to, but as they walked the halls, if there was a light that went on, they didn't see that as their problem. And that's the part we have to change. We have to figure out how they can be part of the system and, um, and still deal with their assignment, but they are part of the system. And all those patients need a nurse, and sometimes they can be the ones to attend to that. So that was very insightful. So um, a little bit more about the phases of this whole 
partnership and, and curricular rollout. Like I said earlier, we have five semesters in our curriculum. They, it's a four-year BSM program. The first um, year and a half is gen ed's uh, prerequisite science courses. And then they enter into the nursing curriculum the second semester of their sophomore year. So the first two semesters is truly the population-focused health promotion um, uh, concepts. Semester two, they start to work with clients who have mental health problems, and they're still embedded into the community. It's not in an acute care setting. And many of those, um, those clients are very vulnerable, oftentimes, you know, homeless, living in a, um, a you know, a, a facility for patients with those needs, or people with those needs. But they also have chronic diseases. So we saw, you know, we needed to help these students understand where these clients live before they enter into the hospital so they know how to help them go home. And we know that's even going to be more and more important as things continue to change and there's rapid, rapid um, a turnover as far as how long a person can stay in an acute care setting. So we had the semester coordinators and they were responsible for integrating. They, we also put together, the faculty, I give them credit for this, um, put together crosswalks that would allow them not only to look at the concepts and the competencies of CUSIN across the curriculum, but also skills. And then to determine if there was overlap, if there, was, there were gaps, um, and how they could clinically apply these um, concepts and skills. And then they had monthly meetings with all five semester coordinators. So there was a way to evaluate the um, integration between semesters as well as within semesters. And then we had to over haul our entire clinical adjunct um, orientation so that they could be on board with this process. In phase one in the practice setting, um, some of it I've already discussed. There was the shadowing to see what the clinical experience was. Um, again, I would see two students, four students standing in the hall waiting for clinical instructors to pass medication. You know, the, what we call in Northwest Ohio, praying to the Pixis. Um, <laughs> And this, there was little time for clinical discussion. The clinical instructors were, were task-oriented, not because they wanted to be, but because that's what they had to do at that point in time. Um, the student nurses and the adjuncts were working in isolation, and then the RN was watching and rescuing, but no role in education was their attitude. So again, the design was changed. It was same unit, same patient population, same nursing staff, two semesters back to back. The staff have really enjoyed that component. And the other is, is that we continued on and taught the bedside nurses. And we asked the simple questions, why CUSIN? What is CUSIN? And what is the different about this group of students? How are they going to behave differently? The other piece of phase one it was that faculty and um, staff nurse development. And because we had the grant, we were able to bring in some of our Houston national consultants. Jane Barnsteiner was our consultant. And she worked with not just with us, but with, with the ProMedica um, staff, which, which I think is very important as we try to, to um, narrow the gaps that sometimes exist between academics and practice. How can we communicate and, um, and see that we do have common goals? So after we rede redesigned um, our curriculum, semester three and four were our major acute care um, focused uh, clinical experiences. And like Chris has said, we had the students stay in the same clinical unit for those two semesters. Now, there was some integration um, in semester three where half of the semester they did act, um, have clinical um, experiences in maternal child and pediatric. But for half the semester, they were in a med-surg acute care, and then they stayed in that um, setting for the fourth semester. 
And that allowed them to also apply the concepts related to leadership. They were able to cha shadow managers on that unit. Um, and so not only applying what they were learning as far as caring for the individual, but starting to get more involved in the systems um, focus. And then this is where they were involved in quality uh, improvement projects. And Chris will talk about the specifics of that a little bit. Phase two of our rollout was really the continuous evaluation. And um, this is really not um, very different than what most academic programs currently had. But we did have to try to standardize and redesign all of these evaluation tools. So evaluating our students in the lab, in the clinical agencies, using the cues and concepts. The same thing with course evaluations. Um, looking at um, some of the focus groups. We conduct focus groups every senior year. We have a senior focus group um, with our, our students that are graduating. And then, of course, looking at how they evaluated us. Um, um, all of this had to be redesigned with our curriculum. Now, the big question was, how are these students going to do on NCLEX? And I'll tell you, we just had our first group that went through the five semesters graduate. And we started with us, normally we, we accept anywhere from 42 to 60 students a semester, so we could have 120 in an academic year going through. Um, but we, the first group, we did limit that to 30. I was able to stay. <laughs> no, with the grant, that helped. That did help. But we wanted to make sure this curriculum was effective to, before we had a full capacity. And out of the 30, 15 have taken their boards. We've had one failure. So we feel like that's good. And actually, what we're hearing back, and, and we do um, use ATI, and um, we use the ATI comprehensive exam, this, the, the concept based um, curriculum is working. I mean, they're actually um, doing well on some of those predictor tests. So we're feeling like this is rolling out like we had hoped, and um, we'll keep you posted. Just a short FYI about that concept based working in curriculum. Those of you in practice, it also works with staff development, education. We have a lot of stuff to train, and people's orientations are getting shorter and shorter. The educators in, at the Center of Nursing Excellence are now looking at how can I teach the concept under all of this and get it through quickly. So that's what we learned from our partners. Excuse me. Um, Continuous evaluations and clinical, what we did was is that we had end-of-semester student evaluations that were provided by our quality improvement. And in the, in the theme of wanting to stay with CUSIN, we developed questions based around the six competencies. The, the students' perceptions were evaluated, they were uh, graphed, and then that information on, on those, and those are the number of questions that we had in each of the different topics, um, were reported back to the faculty. But there were 13 additional integration questions that were reported only to the clinical directors and to the CNOs, because we felt that that was very important for us to know if we were doing our side of the partnership. We also did another survey, and this time we surveyed the registered nurses on the units for these educational, and we asked them one question. We asked, what could we do to improve your experience with students? Number one thing coming back was the use of communication. We also expanded in phase two. We now are in five hospitals. Uh, we changed the orientation. We now have a debriefing at the end of every semester with the uh, clinical adjuncts. And we have made a commitment that this is going to be an evergreen process, both for practice and academics. Judy? And I think the other piece about phase two, I talked um, a little bit about what's on the slide already, but just to add to that, like any change, we had the early adopters and the late adopters. So that included faculty. Um, how, does this, how is this going to work? So we had those that were very energetic and wanted to, you know, couldn't wait to get this started. And then we had those that were very skeptical. And that's normal. But what happens with that is you have conflict. So um, in our, our um, 
our department that was always, we had to keep open communication amongst faculty. We had to agree to disagree because trying to have a full faculty embrace something at 100% is a lofty goal. So, um, so that was one of the um, phase two issues that we had to deal with that we really didn't know. And I think now that we're getting the outcomes um, coming down that are very positive, things are much more um, accepting. So those of you who are in academics, how are you going to sell this? How are you going to sell it to your partners that you need to be in a partnership, that you want more than a clinical site from them? Well, maybe we can tell them what the benefits are to them. And that's what we're going to talk about next. Um, we did face-to-face -face education. The faculty came in and talked at the unit practice council meetings. They helped explain the legal roles of what our state says you can and can't do. There was a lot of mentoring at the bedside. There was a lot of role-playing about how to help new learners understand. And one of the projects this semester for is this one. And this truly was the aha moment for the clinical directors. I asked the clinical directors of each of these units, give me your hot topics. The students need to learn how to do QI. We had them do three different types of observation. An observation, we had them do some chart mining, and then we asked the students, well, tell us what that data means. And so they created graphs, and they went through all that component. Looks just like the NDNQI does to our clinical directors, that information. On top of that, then we asked them, well, we want an evidence-based notebook. So the students created an evidence-based notebook of current practice. And that charts, graphs, and evidence-based practice all gets turned into the clinical director. The clinical director then presents that at the unit practice meetings, and that rolls down. Let me give you a really good example of integration. We had uh, on one of our units, we had the students doing hand washing. And we created the form so that they knew how, what they were looking for. And they said the nurses were doing really great, but you know, the environmental services. Well, that piece of information went back to the director. The director said, well, wait, this is great. And that education then went to environmental services, and the next time infection control observed them, they got, their grades were much, much higher. Student initiated. Um, so what are the academic benefits? Well, the students learn collaboration with practice, assessment, observation, and data skills. They learn literature review, scholarly writing, and annotated bibliography, group work, and oral, oral presentations. What did practice get out of that? Well, we got secret shoppers. Um, data outcomes were used by our unit practice meetings, which is always wonderful. We're always looking for our metrics, and therefore the students provided us with three different sets of metrics. The students became part of our healthcare team. There was, from practice side, there was now a valuing of the students' contributions to evidence-based practice. And the students were now viewed as uh, part of the clinical practice. A couple of the directors said, they're like fresh eyes to us. Sustainability? Always a challenge. <laughs> but I think um, if you were to summarize, these are our you know, some of the issues that we're dealing with, and we're going to talk a little bit about lessons learned, but if you're to summarize how we feel as far as sustainability, one of the strengths is that we know that our clinical partner has a vested interest now in our curriculum, in how our students perform, and they now see it as their success as well as ours. So this, to me, was you know, the grand finale. And this came unexpectedly this May. It was Nurses Week, and uh, the Toledo Blade um, is our local paper. And I looked, and I said, oh, my gosh. And here we have ProMedica Nursing at the forefront of safety and quality. And, you know, first I'm saying, oh, they stole our idea. We're, you know, we bring this in. No. But if you look down where the red arrow is, they gave us credit for bringing this to them. And now they're using it as advertisement. I mean, I think this shows total buy-in. It had nothing to do with Chris or I. Neither of us knew this was going to be printed. This was from the CNOs at all of those facilities that made the decision to have this article in the paper. So when we measure outcomes, to me, this tells the story that there is an interest 
to continue the work that we've started. And it's, it truly demonstrates a reciprocal relationship between how we changed education and practice is embracing that. We did learn a few things along the way. And the first one is that none of us, and actually we're just going to talk, none of us work in silos. Practice cannot and neither can academics. That communication needs to be planned and it needs to be frequent. Those of you in academics, take your CNO to lunch. And if there's a CNO in the, in the audience, take your dean. Mechanisms for, for monitoring the partnership has to be in place and benefits for both sides to have that partnership. We have to acknowledge them and visit them frequently. I think the other lesson we learned was that academic clinical partnerships are organic. Um, they're constantly evolving and we really need to pay attention to the communication how we can standardize so that there's predictability when our students come for clinical education. And then the financial piece. Um, we don't have external funding anymore, and well, I have soon. But if we can impact the quality of care on that, in that um, clinical agency, we are impacting their financial <laughs> bottom line. So I think that and the fact that um, as, as our graduates move into the clinical setting, we're hoping that, you know, through the CUSIN-based curriculum, they will have that systems thinking. They will be able to see a bigger picture about the healthcare environment. And with this ever, ever changing, quick-paced um, healthcare delivery system and, and where it's going, we have no idea. Um, we need to make sure that our students are ready for the flexibility and the change they're going to have to face. So um, this is where, this is our story. So what we'd like to do is open this up to all of you for questions or talk about your experiences. If you have any questions. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that really nice presentation. Um, my name is Pam Colbury. I'm from the San Diego area. And Chris, I was really interested in what you said about when you step back a little bit, you have a number of other schools of nursing. We have a variety of schools of nursing and a, a number of hospitals in our area. And we're a new school. have been very well received since 2006, and I felt a lot of a lot of support, probably more than we probably I don't want to say deserved, but certainly felt a lot of support. But now, really sense that you know we're one of many, and if we all took the CNO to lunch, she'd be going out to lunch every other week. And so we've tried to think about how we can be um, collaborative not something quite as elaborate as this, but how would you suggest being collaborative when you're one of many and don't want to put an organization um, in an uncomfortable position where they feel like, oh, we're treating you differently and giving you certain um, things, particularly in the face of what we're starting to see as um, organizations charging for clinicals and the public health arena in particular um, starting I heard last week. So I'd just be real interested in your thoughts and considerations for that. It's a great question. And I think we all are aware that uh, we are going to have to become very creative in how we train our future nurses because clinical sites and the numbers of students in a clinical mm -hmm. site can be overwhelming. Um, and you're right. I, I, my CNOs would not appreciate me having everyone take them to, to lunch because even though it would be fun, um, they probably wouldn't get enough work done. I think what I keep telling practice is don't, don't drop the ball. Don't forget why we're here. We're all here for the patients. And if we can remember that and we can say that to the students and to the deans and say, what can we do for the patients and how can we work together to do that? Using that approach, remembering why we are nurses, helps in investing in that clinical experience. Um, many of my managers, when we first approached them 
about being an educational resource unit. They weren't too excited about it because they sounded like it was going to be a lot of work. Of course, their first question back to me, how's this going to hit my budget? Um, And I came back and I said, you know, these students are interviewing you. They want to come work, and you have open positions. Couldn't we do this some way, this way? And as soon as I could help them understand that the students are close to graduation and will be looking for work, and not only are they looking to see if they like this patient population and the nurses in this unit, but you get the opportunity to see if you like this student. Write down that name. If you got a stellar student, write down that name. When their name comes across HR, you pan pick that person because you already know that they know how to answer all the call lights in all 20 rooms. But I, I, I hear that it is a very difficult thing, and I think that creativity is really going to be part of what the solution is. Thank you for the question. I know we're all in fear of the pay for <laughs> clinical, but I, I, I go back to the fact that the kind of student we have and the quality of our program is how we're going to continue to have clinical sites. We have two um, schools in our area that actually are affiliated with hospitals, so they have all the... <laughs> they automatically get the, um, those placements, and it's, it, it, it's a challenge, but if they like your graduates, they're going to want to work with your students. I, I really, truly believe that, and um, we have to be accountable to that. We can't just drop our students down and say, go, without continuously being involved in their lives, either through offering continuing education or having some, um, some type of joint programming with your professional organizations. But we have to be very creative about it. We can't assume they're going to take our students. And I know for a fact there are schools that they will not take as readily because of that. So I guess that's my two cents. Thank you for your discussion. Since I have a dedicated education unit at our school, we, we've struggled with some of the same academic practice issues that you have. A question, and maybe you said it and I didn't hear, how are your students, um, their clinical days? Are these full days that they're practicing? Are these alternative shifts? Are they rotating at all? Are they getting some sense of that socialization and professional comportment type of thing? As they're working Cur- currently, semester three is six uh, eight-hour days. It is on the day shift. Um, this, that is the team that is um, rotating through front loaded or back loaded to peds and OB. Okay. Um, and that then they turn around and they're still on days a Tuesday. If they were a, like a Wednesday clinical in the fall and the spring, they are a Tuesday Wednesday clinical. It is still on days, um, but the. Uh, uh, the fifth goes into preceptorship, and then the preceptorship, that's 110 hours one-on-one with a uh, member of our team. So we, we have not so gone up. We have so not, the preceptorship's in the same model then as yes. well? Okay, good. Um, well, not quite. Uh, go ahead. The precepted clinical, because they're one-on-one with the preceptor, um, they are with that preceptor no matter what shift they're on. Okay. So that's where they have their socialization. <laughs> into um, weekends and nights, I guess you would say. Um, But we have had to actually, because we've only offered semester five, what is it, twice, Chris? Yeah. Um, We have really, we realize we need to do some some development with that also because they have to understand um, the curriculum and where our students are coming from and what the objectives and expectations are. So I think we, we're looking at semester five differently and also because of resources. It's hard to place the students anymore because of competition. So we'll, we, we, you know, we're open to new models if we can, um, you know, if that's what we have to do. But, yeah. Thank you. That was really helpful. Thank you. It was a great, great presentation. I'm Mary Gordon from Drexel University, and I have a question you had raised um, about the affiliation agreements. Did you have to make changes in your agreement with your hospitals with this process? No, we didn't. Um, The only contractual work we had to do was 
for Chris. With her. Yes, because that would be Chris a is contract. technically an employee, and we subcontracted. Um, oh, good. Thank for you. Her. But otherwise, the students, uh, those clinical affiliations, we didn't. Okay. The only thing that we really did do is, is we looked at the negotiation component of asking for, and we asked initially the two hospitals who agreed to be part of this partnership mm -hmm. if they would let us have the same unit two Certain semesters floors. back and forward. Right. It was wonderful that that negotiation happened just at the right time. But you didn't have that in, in your agreement, like in an exhibit or anything. That was just... That, w that was a formal. Thanks. Hi, I'm Ivy Tawson from Western University in Pomona, California. So um, I have a few questions. So when you were designing your semester three in which you integrated all three PEDS, uh, L&D, as well as Med Surge, so you have six students. So do they then, so do you divide the students into, so you have two in L&D, two in PEDS, and then two in Med Surge, and then they just kind of rotate? Or is it several shifts in one area? The, the six students stay together, uh -huh. and they're either in med surge or okay. they rotate to peds and, and OB. And some of that, they're separated out, okay. but there's still one instructor in, in charge. Okay. Because all of our, I don't know if you're experiencing this, but our peds and maternal child clinicals resources are becoming slimmer. So we're having to look probably more community-based for some of our, our pediatric. Um, but Conceptually, if you look at concept base, it could be a little person or a big right. person. They're exactly. still having oxygenation. They're still having some of these, you know, the concepts still fit. Right. So it's just, you know, you have to incorporate the developmental and, and of course, the right. medication issues. So and things. do your clinical instructors then need to remediate into P's and L and D for them to be board approved? Because in in California, we, we need to have our faculty to be pediatric board approved and med surge. So if they are then teaching all three, they're not teaching, I, I yeah. no, they're not teaching all three. Uh -huh. and they don't teach in all three. Three, we split them. Oh, got it. It is separate. Okay. One, one week they're in med surge, and the next week they're in peds. The next week they're in med surge, and the next week they're in peds. They have two experiences in peds, two experiences in OB, six experiences in med surge. Got it. Okay. Three and a different structure. What pulls it together is that the clinical evaluation tool, the cl all three clinical instructors have access to that online, as do the students. Okay. So if there's a problem with a student with a behavior, it's not taken care of when it's first addressed. All three of those clinical instructors will see that behavior and when it becomes a pattern and when we nip it in the bud. Okay. That's really where the big team, the teamwork, the collaboration, the communication piece is really honed in very, very specifically. Okay. And then for um, for hiring wise, do you then give preference to Lourdes graduates? I wish I could say yes. <laughs> We do give preference for BSN. Okay. They have to speak. They have to answer to that themselves at, at that point. But, um, yeah. Okay. Thanks for all this great information. Um, I'm Jen Chesbro. I'm from the College of Brockport in Western New York State. We also have um, a direct educational unit with one of our hospitals. And um, it has worked really, really well. Uh, it's been going on for, I think, four to five years now. And initially, we did a lot of training with the nurses, the nurses who are with the students. So it's two students with one RN, and then there's a supervising instructor that oversees. Um, and usually, we have two DEU units. So a supervising um, instructor is looking over 16 students and um, eight RNs. And it works really well, though. The RNs love it. The students love it. The problem we're having, though, is that now we have been doing it long enough that the nurses aren't quite as... Um, I don't want to say astute, but they're not as on top of things as they had been at the beginning when they're seeing problem behaviors. Um, and as what you're talking about with the turnover, as new RNs are coming in and taking over those clinical roles, um, they aren't necessarily holding up to the same standards that we had before. And so we're working on trying to have communication. The, we started out the DEU, the hospital that we worked with, were giving them a stipend for 
um, working with the students. And that's just like all the other hospitals um, around, that hospital isn't able to do that anymore. And so we're running into a situation where we are, as the instructors are talking to that, those RNs, trying to bring up those standards again and make those expectations a little more clear and try to offer those RNs more support. But the RNs are feeling overwhelmed because they have two students with them two days a week. And um, they're not getting the stipend they used to. And although their heart is really in it, it's a lot of extra work for them. So is there anything you can offer about how to keep those RNs enthusiastic? We're definitely trying communication, but you've given me some great ideas on how maybe we can improve that. But do you have anything else that maybe we could try? Um, I think the first thing is, again, ask them what, what is it that they need? You know, we've identified that there's a problem. Can you tell us what would make it better for you? Okay. And, and of course, they're going to tell you money, and then you can say thank you, but we can't do that. Um, and then you say, what else besides money do you want? Is it recognition? Is it education? Is it some type of uh, reassignment of some kind? Okay. Do you not want to have students for a semester? Do you want a semester off? Would that help? Um, I would ask them. That's a great idea. All those are great ideas. Yeah. I, I would also. Do they get, do they, in a clinical setting, do the nurses get any kind of credit towards their clinical ladder in taking clinical? The, the hospital that we work in, um, they are not magnet yet. They're working towards it. So we have talked about that there will be uh, something towards clinical, some kind of clinical ladder. We um, don't offer a master's program yet, but we're working on that. But we've talked about that when our school does offer um, a DMP, FMP program, that we can give them leadership credit okay. towards those degrees. Um, but right now, we're making certificates and plaques for the unit, and we actually are trying to figure out a way to give the nurses gift cards. But that's, I mean, it, these, it, this is all new steps. So I don't know if they'll work or not. They sound great. Um, in our practice setting, what occurs is that we don't have a clinical ladder, but we have what's called a PEP program, where you earn points for being active in certain things. And in the semester five preceptors, they earn points, and they can end up earning a considerable amount of money at the end of the year by getting these points. So um, it, it, we also look at these PEP points for um, advancement. So if you have been a preceptor and you're working on that, and you'd like a supervisory role, we pay attention to those kind of things. The only other comment I would make is to ask them how, they, how prepared they feel those students are. Um, precepting is a okay. tough uh, role, mm -hmm. and the more fresh the student is, the harder it is for that RN mm -hmm. um, to precept. Okay. Um, and when we, you know, we don't assign our students like that. The faculty's there on a six to one, mm -hmm. and then the they work with the the um, the staff. But we do have the one to one, but it's the very last semester, so mm -hmm. they're taking on um, the role of the new grad, I guess. Right. Um, but yeah, I I've seen other programs where they start out and precepted, and that's very very difficult yeah. for for. We, a, a we actually tried that for one semester, and it didn't work. No. And so now it's their that's either their second or their third rotations, and and so that's how. But th those are great insights. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, I'm Kathy Linville from Prince George's Community College near here. Um, and uh, teaching associate degree students is a little different. We've, we've run into this competition because there's so many universities around. And, um, and so uh, a lot of clinical agencies don't want us anymore, and we're always you know, struggling to find places. But um, for our psych uh, courses, I mean, I, I'm the team leader for our psychiatric nursing. And um, actually haven't had a whole lot of trouble because we go into community agencies as well as acute care units, and we've managed to make this work so far, although our groups are bigger. We have eight students. But you said your students only do, um, I mean, I know they apply the concepts all the way through, but in terms of focusing on mental health, they start out in the community, and, and then they, what? <laughs> they actually have a whole semester um, in a clinic. In, uh, in clinical sites where P 
people with mental health problems are. So yeah. they're not necessarily mental health agencies. Right, Some right. are homeless shelters. Um, we have a number of subsidized housing um, units in yeah. our area, apartment size, that have yeah. housing. And that's where they're at. And yeah. um, where they're... There are some acute care um, settings they could go in, but that's not our major focus um, because they're also um, integrating. Well, they integrate their uh, their pharmacology assessment and and mental health that same semester. Oh, so I see. that's how we they, we've they handled it. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. But how do they learn the uh, pharma, uh, the pharmacology of treating uh, they, psychiatric? They three yeah. And then they take those three separate theory courses, integrate into the clinical, so they'll review medications with the patient, yeah. um, or the, the clients out in the facility. They pull their assessment skills in and do those mini assessments and do the assessment clinics. And then in mental health, they discuss when they talk about So they may not pass meds that semester, right. but they're oh. they're in charge of under helping that person manage understand. Their, yeah, and with and most of the time they're they're on more than just um, you know, oh, med mental true. health issues that's drugs. True. They have many chronic issues that coincide with that. So so they have to apply all that in that setting. Yeah. It's probably it's actually a pretty good. Um, experience for them because they see the same thing in the in the acute care setting. If you have any other questions, our business cards are up here. We'd be happy to contact and and talk to you. Okay. Thank you.